Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Sorry for the delay. Uh, and yeah, thanks very much for putting up with me for yet another talk. For this last one. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so uh, so what I want to talk about today is uh, the applications of some of these parameterization spaces that I was talking about the last couple of days. So, so these were some of the some of the co-regular spaces and and what they were parameterizing. This is what we were talking about the last couple of days, and so and so yesterday afternoon, I, t I mean yesterday in the second half of the talk, I talked about uh, how one can. Uh, count points of bounded height, uh, count orbits of bounded height uh, in co-regular spaces. And so one can go and apply those techniques to, uh, to each of these spaces and then see what it says. And usually it doesn't say anything very interesting. <laughs> so for example, if you look at the first, uh, if you look at the first, uh, first entry there, it says binary quartic forms. Binary quartic forms parameterize genus 1 curves and degree 2 line bundles. Uh, and the invariance means something in terms of the A4 and A6 of the Jacobian of that curve. And so you are counting something. You're counting some elliptic curves of bounded height together with the number of degree two line bundles whose associated invariants are bounded. Okay, so you get some sort of count. Uh, and you get some sort of count randomly sounding like that in each of these cases. Uh, so, so the moral is that you can't just... What, what was the reason that we were collecting all these parameterizations? It's not necessarily that... Uh, that the exact things that they're parameterizing are interesting to count. Uh, it's more to build up uh, a, a database, a collection of parameterizations, and then one can then go and look at arithmetic statistics problems that one is interested in, and then see if it can be embedded in one of these, uh, in one of these parameterization spaces. And if, if the embedding uh, into these parameterization spaces is sufficiently dense in the set of orbits in that parameterization space, then one can try to use sieve methods to extract the information that you actually want, rather than just applying methods to each of these parameterization spaces. So the, uh, so the art in a lot of these things is first to build up a, lot of, a large collection of parameterization spaces, and then look at the problems that one is interested in and try to embed them. Uh, if one has a sufficiently large collection, then one can hope that uh, one will be able to find a parameterization space that will be helpful in that particular problem. So, so when a lot of these uh, parameterization spaces were involving genus one curves, then sort of a natural a uh, question that I was always interested in is this question of average rank of curves. So if you look at elliptic curves and vary them, say, over all elliptic curves or in special families, what can, can one say anything about the average rank uh, uh, of the elliptic curves in that family? So, so that's the question. What is the rank of elliptic curves on average? And so this is a question that we can try to see if one can embed this problem in one, of the, uh, in one or more of the parameterization spaces that we already have. So, so, of course, in order to ask this question more precisely, we have to say which elliptic curves we're talking about. I want to talk about all of them in this talk. And then we need a natural uh, way to measure the size of elliptic curves. So you can order them uh, in some way and then ask the average with respect to that ordering. So the answer could depend on the ordering, although most orderings, we suspect the, the answer wouldn't matter. But just to give you an example where the order would matter, if you ordered them by rank, <laughs> then <laughs> the average rank would be zero <laughs> because you'd never see the rank once. <laughs> Um, okay, so, so the measure I'm going to use uh, in this lecture is the simplest such measure called the naive height. So this is sort of the natural way in which you were, if you were writing down elliptic curves by yourself, you'd probably start with small coefficient ones and get bigger and bigger. And so naive height measures the size of the coefficients of the defining equation of the elliptic curve. That's sort of the most natural uh, uh, hands-on measuring device, just the size of the coefficients. So I'll make this more precise. So to define the naive height, uh, we use the following fact that every uh, rational elliptic curve can be written uh, uh, as a Weierstrass curve in which the x squared uh, coefficient vanishes. So any elliptic curve over q can be written as y squared equals xq plus ax plus b, where a and b are integers. And in fact, any uh, elliptic over q is isomorphic to unique such e, a, b. Uh, that satisfies the following condition that for all primes p, uh, if p to the 4 divides a, then p to the 6 doesn't divide b. Okay, so in that way, you can write, there you have a canonical, sort of a canonical form for every elliptic curve over Q, namely you write it as y squared equals xq plus ax plus b, where a and b satisfy this minimality condition at every prime. And the reason is that if you had both of these things happening, that a and b were both divisible by high powers of p, well then you could do an easy transformation, send x to p squared x prime and y to p cubed y prime. And e, a, b, you would see, is isomorphic to e, a over p to the 4 and b, p over p 
to the 6. Okay, so you can always remove these extra factors, and so you get a canonical. Uh, so these minimal guys where you have this property for all p's that p to the 4 divides a implies p to the 6 doesn't divide b, you have a canonical then representation as eab for every elliptic curve over q. Okay, so the, these are the minimal forms, and we're, we'll always write our elliptic curves over q as an eab, where a, b satisfy these minimality conditions and our integers. Uh, okay, so once we have these minimal forms for every elliptic curve over q, then we just define the height of E by the size of the, the coefficients of that minimal defining equation. So more precisely, uh, if E is EAB with A and B satisfying these minimality conditions, then the height of EAB is defined to be the maximum of A cubed and B squared. Okay, so a, it's A cubed and B squared that are comparable in size, like A is kind of the A4 and B is kind of the A6, so when you cube one and square the other, those are the things that are kind of comparable. And the height's just defined to be the maximum of the absolute value of A cubed and B squared. Uh, well, actually, there's a 4 and 27 there, but they don't really matter. You could get rid of them. Could put, uh, 4 and 27 make all the constants and uh, come out nicely, and there's another natural reason for it, which is that the discriminant of EAB is minus 4A cubed minus 27B squared. So this way, you're sort of taking the maximum of the, of the terms occurring in the discriminant, <coughs> maximum of the absolute values of the terms occurring in the discriminant. So that's called the, the height of E, or the naive height of E. And the number of elliptic curves that have bounded height is finite. It's easy to see. Uh, so the naive height is, is also related to other kinds of sizes that you might consider for elliptic curves. For example, it's essentially the exponential of what's called the faulting's height. Uh, and another related measure of the size is called the discriminant, as I just mentioned. And so the height is just the maximum of the terms occurring in the discriminant. And then there's another measure called the conductor. Uh, and the conductor has this, uh, the set of primes dividing the conductor. Uh, is contained in the set of primes dividing the discriminant. So these are all related quantities. And when conjectures, this is sort of related to ABC kinds of conjectures, is that these various measures on the set of elliptic curves uh, are uh, about the same order of magnitude for all but a negligible proportion of elliptic curves. And so you sort of expect, if you're asking these average rank questions, you don't really, nobody would expect the averages to differ uh, for these various different sizes. Okay, so that's just a conjectural thing, but just to point out that the naive height is about the same order of magnitude. Uh, the, the, it gives a roughly the same kind of ordering on elliptic curves, regardless of which of these natural sizes that one takes. Uh, so we'll just stick with the, 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 the easiest one, which is the naive height, the one that measures the size of the coefficients, defining the curve. Okay, okay so that's the, that's the height. And so now we can ask more precisely uh, our question, which is if all elliptic curves, we take all elliptic curves, E, A, B, these minimal, uh, these minimal models of all elliptic curves over Q, and you order them by the sizes of their coefficients, their heights, what is the average size of the rank? Okay, so that's the question. And the conjecture, of course, uh, as uh, Carl talked about earlier this week, and Alice did last week, I think, uh, is that the conjecture is that the average size you expect to be a half. This originates in the work of Goldfeld, uh, and then, of course, in the work of Kat Sarnak. And more precisely, uh, Carl called it the rank distribution conjecture, uh, more precisely, one expects that 50% of all curves have rank 0 and 50% of all curves have rank 1. And so the average is half. Okay. So, so as to point previously, this average has not even been known to be finite, let alone a half. So it is conceivable that as you take higher, take higher and higher heights, you tend to get more and more points and higher and higher ranks. So this hasn't been known uh, to be finite, uh, at least not unconditionally. And computations. Uh, so I spent a lot of time looking at the computations when I was first thinking about this problem. Uh, they don't give much support to the conjecture either. So there's this paper of Brumer and McGinnis in the 1990s uh, where they computed rank 2 curves, uh, and they found lots of them, and they found more and more of them as they went to higher and higher heights. Uh, so it didn't seem like the rank 2 curves were going to zero density at all, computationally. And then these computations were extended recently by Bechtemirov, Stein, and Watkins, and so uh, I got this table from, I mean, I got this graph on the next slide from William Stein. Uh, so this shows the average rank of all curves of conductor up to 10 to the 8. Uh, so this is the average rank up to this conductor. So average rank up to, uh, up to this conductor, average rank up to this conductor. And you can see that the average rank is just going up as you, uh, as you go to higher and higher conductors. And as you can see, it passed one half just before, even when it started, it was already passed a half. Uh, and it just goes, uh -huh. That's not actually all curves. 
it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a set of curves that are known, yeah, so <laughs> that they had in their database. Uh, yeah, and so, well, okay. <laughs> it is possible that <laughs> somehow the way they were looking for curves were, <laughs> were biased towards higher rank, but it doesn't seem likely. <laughs> Great. So, so, okay, so from, from this graph, it looks like, well, either it might be approaching an asymptote, like 1 or 0.87, <laughs> or, or, or it's going to infinity. I mean, it's not, it's not entirely clear from this graph. Uh, certainly, the data wouldn't indicate that it's going to a half. Uh, of course, I showed this to Peter Sarnak and said, look, this completely disproves your conjecture. He says, no, no, it's going to turn around and come back to a half. <laughs> so <he's, laughs> they're, they're totally confident. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so, okay, so is, first of all, uh, there was the question of even, suppose we even assume uh, conjectures, say GRH and VSD and uh, everything else, can we at least argue that the average rank has to be finite? And so this, this, the first theoretical re result in this direction is uh, due to Brumer. And what he showed that if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis and the Birch and Swinnert and Dyer conjecture <laughs> together, that they imply that the average rank is bounded when you order all curves by height. In fact, at the time he did this, he also assumed modularity, because that wasn't known at the time either. So $2 million worth of conjectures and modularity imply <laughs> The average rank is bounded. Okay, but that at least uh, people believe these conjectures, all three of those things, and so this was a natural. Uh, this made people believe that the average rank should be bounded. Uh, in fact, you got an explicit bound uh, of 2.3. So the average rank is bounded by 2.3 uh, if you assume these conjectures. Uh, so in, in 2004, Heath Brown had this really nice refinement of it, uh, still assuming GRH and BSD. He improved this bound of Brumer to 2.0. No, it's actually exactly two. But so, so a lot of the work uh, after Brumer was to work really hard to get below two. Because <laughs> if you get below two, then that implies that a positive proportion, I mean, assuming these conjectures, a positive proportion of curves would have rank zero or one. And so you could apply Grozagi or Kolivagin to say that, okay, the positive proportion of things will satisfy BSD, assuming GRH. <laughs> So, okay, so that was an application that was into. So, I think he wrote, he wrote 2.0 in his paper and probably to emphasize that. <laughs> if you can make this 1.99, <laughs> that would imply something nice. <laughs> and, in fact, that was... Huh? <laughs> no, so actually, it's a bound on analytic rank that they get. So, it's by analytic methods. It's looking at the order of vanishing of the L function. So, they bound the analytic rank, and if they can get the average analytic rank below 2, then it'll imply something about algebraic rank without BST. Uh, and this was actually done very recently in this nice work of Young. Uh, so, Young further improved this, again, assuming GRH and BSD, uh, to showing that the average uh, analytic rank is less than 1.79, just assuming GRH then. Um, so, that then had that application that GRH implies a positive proportion of BSD being true. Um, okay, so these were, uh, these were the known theoretical results, but again, they're all conditional. So, the hope was that, okay, maybe we can take this problem and embed it into one of these parameterization spaces. Uh, that I was talking about in the last couple of days, and and then maybe one could say something unconditional, and so that's that's the theorem I want to talk about. So the main theorem is that the unconditionally, when elliptic curves e over q are bounded, are ordered by height, the average rank is bounded. Uh, and in fact, the bound uh, the bound we get uh, is actually better than the one that we get from doing the, the analytic method and assuming GRH. So the average rank is bounded by 1.5. So as you mentioned, this is all, everything, most everything I'm talking about today is joint uh, with R.L. Schenker. So this is, so the average rank is bounded by 1.5 if you order all elliptic curves by height. Uh, uh, so actually we prove something stronger, uh, namely we prove things about the two-selmer rank, not just the rank. So so the same is true for the, is in fact true for the two-selmer rank, which is bigger than the rank, uh, often. So the, the average size of the two-selmer rank when elliptic curves are about, uh, ordered by height is bounded by 1.5. So, so just to remind you, uh, Carl already explained this nicely, but the, the two-selmer group of an elliptic curve uh, fits into an exact sequence like this. So the two-selmer group is in the middle. So it's kind of a combination of uh, EQ mod 2 of EQ, 2 times EQ, uh, and the two-torsion in Sha. And so by getting a bound on the rank of the two Selmer group, uh, you end up getting the same upper bound for each of the two things that are on the, 
on the, the two sides of the Talmud group, namely e mod 2, 2 e, and, and the two torsion in Shah. So what that means is that the, the two rank of e mod 2 e is also bounded on average by 1.5, and, and the two torsion in Shah, that, that two rank of the two torsion in Shah is also bounded uh, on average by a finite constant, namely 1.5. Uh, it also says that the, the two torsion on E, uh, the, rank, the two rank of that is bounded on average. Okay, I think we knew that. <laughs> so actually what one can show fairly easily is that the average, the average size of the two torsion uh, on E is zero. <laughs> well, I mean, sorry, one. <laughs> okay. Now you don't get non-trivial two torsion uh, if you pick a random curve. So those have zero density. Uh, okay, so actually we proved something stronger. Uh, Namely, that when elliptic curves E over Q are ordered by height, uh, the average size of the two Selman group is exactly three. Okay, so that's, that's actually the result that's proven. Uh, and the reason, well, you can think of why that implies the result on rank, because if, the, okay, so the average size of the two Selman group is, uh, is three. So it's never exactly three. It's, it's always a power of two, right? but on average it's three. Okay. And so the worst case scenario for the rank is if half of them are two and half of them are four. Right? And so that would mean half of the, and then the worst case scenario there is that half of them have rank one and half of them have rank two. And that's why you get the bound of 1.5. Okay, so the average size of the two Selmer group is three. Uh, in fact, something slightly stronger is true, which is that when all elliptic curves in any family defined by finite many congruence conditions uh, are ordered by height, the average size of the two Selmer group uh, is exactly three. And and the reason we were actually interested in doing this for congruence conditions, well, you'll see other reasons uh, later on, uh, is because a lot of times uh, people, uh, there are many papers trying, uh, constructing large Selmer groups by imposing certain two added conditions on the coefficients. Uh, and what this shows is that that will never work in the long run to produce uh, large Selmer groups, that the average size is going to be three in any, in any family defined by congruence conditions. Uh, okay, so, so that's, the, that's the result I want to talk about. Uh, so how does it come from one of these? Any questions on that? Oh, you, oh sorry. Okay, you're just scratching your head. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So how does one how does one prove that? So the problem is related to counting binary forms. So I already talked uh, a little bit about this before. So I talked about the quadratic and cubic cases, right? So, oh yeah, sure. I mean, uh, by the naive height, the way I defined it before. No, no, because each, uh, each elliptic curve had a, had a unique representation as EAB, with the A and B minimal. Yeah, and then we're defining naive height just in terms of those minimal coefficients. Yeah, so each one is coming just once. Uh, okay, so, okay, so remember, for binary quadratic forms, SL2Z acts on binary quadratic forms, and as I mentioned, there's just one invariant called B squared minus 4AC, and that's the unique SL2 polynomial invariant. And Minkowski's theorem is that there's only finitely many SL2Z equivalence classes of binary quadratic forms having a given value of the discriminant. So they're only finitely many, and so the natural question is to ask is how many such orbits do you expect uh, on average? So how many classes HD are there with discriminant D uh, when D is at most some large number X? And so this is a theorem I mentioned a couple days ago, uh, conjectured by Gauss and his disquisitiones and proven by Mertens and Ziegel later on is that if you sum h of d uh, for imaginary uh, quadratic orders up to absolute discriminant x, it grows as an explicit constant times x to the 3 halves. Uh, and there's an analogous result. This was proven by Ziegel, which I didn't mention a couple days ago. But uh, as Henri mentioned, it's very hard in the real quadratic case to, to separate the regulator and the, uh, and the class number. But if you take their product, then again, you have a similar asymptotic. Uh, this time it's pi squared instead of pi, but otherwise it looks more or less the same. Okay, so those are, those are asymptotics uh, for binary quadratic forms. And the point that I just want you to take from this is that on average, that means that HD is sort of on the order of D to the half. That's what this means, because right? the sum is growing like X to the 3 halves. So its size is, for in the imaginary case, right, the size of HD is growing with the discriminant. Right? The number of orbits having a given discriminant is getting bigger and bigger as D gets bigger. And that's in contrast to the case of cubic forms. Right? So if we go to the next case of cubic forms, Right? So if you look at binary cubic forms over Z, 
Then again, GL2Z naturally acts in such forms. And again, there's just one polynomial invariant for this action. Uh, unlike b squared minus 4ac, most people don't remember this. I always forget it too, so it's that. <laughs> so this is the discriminant of a binary cubic form. It's the unique polynomial invariant again, in the sense that every other polynomial invariant is a polynomial in this one. And again, it's true, by a similar kind of reduction theory or Minkowski uh, geometry of numbers type argument, that is, uh, as before, there exists only finitely many GL2Z equivalent classes of binary cubic forms having a given value of the discriminant. That's like the class number for binary cubics. And so again, we can ask how many classes of irreducible binary cubic forms uh, are there having discriminant d, or in a range of d, so over all d at most x. And so this is the theorem of Davenport, uh, 1951, that I mentioned a couple of days ago, which is that if you take the total number of classes of binary cubic forms of discriminant d up to absolute discriminant x, it grows as a constant times x. And these are the constants for positive and negative discriminant, pi squared over 24 and pi squared over 72. Uh, but you can see that the, the, the main difference here with, uh, with the gauss mertens Ziegel theorem is that now you see that on average, the number of, of classes of forms per discriminant is finite. Right? It's, a bounded, it's a bounded number. So it's about like pi squared over something 24-ish uh, for negative discriminants and about pi squared over 72 for positive discriminants. Okay, so these are the cases of binary quadratic and binary cubic. And so what I want to discuss is the case of binary quartic, which, uh, which I was talking about um, uh, in yesterday's lecture. So, so if you look at binary quartic forms where the coefficients are in z, okay, are integers, then again, GL2Z acts on these forms. But now there's not just one invariant. There are two invariants for this action, uh, which are traditionally called i and j. And here are the values of i. So this i is some degree 2 thing in a, b, c, d, e. And j is this degree 3 thing in a, b, c, d, e. And they're both invariants. And it turns out that they generate the ring of polynomial invariants. So this is the main difference when one goes from cubic to quartic, is that if you're trying to count uh, count binary quartics, there's sort of two invariants that you have to deal with uh, that are independent. And, but again, it's true that if you fix both i and j, then there exist only finitely many GL2z equivalence classes of integral binary quartic forms having that value of i, I and j. So it's the, it's the ana uh, analogous thing for class number. You can then talk about 8 sub ij, the number of classes of binary quartic forms that have those invariants i and j. Okay, so we can call that h of ij, and that's a finite, again, a finite class number. So yeah, for general co-regular spaces, uh, this is a theorem of Borel and Harris gender that says that if you fix the values of, of the invariants, then the number of uh, integer orbits that have those invariants is always going to be finite. And so you can ask about the average size of class number for, for general such co-regular spaces. And this is one example uh, where there are two invariants. Okay, so, so we can ask how many equivalence classes of binary quartic forms are there having bounded i and j? Okay, so that's the analogous question to what we asked in the quadratic and cubic cases. Yeah. Okay. okay, so analogous to how we define the minimal height of elliptic curves, okay, we can define the height of a binary quartic form uh, by defining the height of that binary quartic form f to be the maximum of i cubed and j squared. Again, with funny constants, they're, they're just for convenience, they don't really matter. So h of f or h of ij is just defined to be the maximum of the absolute values of i cubed and j squared, more or less, i cubed and j squared over 4. And then we can ask how many equivalence classes, how many GL2z equivalence classes of binary quartic forms are there that have height less than x? Right? That's the question of asking how many binary quartic forms are there having bounded invariants, okay, so having height less than x. And as I mentioned yesterday, if you look at just uh, reduction theory methods, then those immediately imply that that this number of binary quartic forms up to equivalence uh, having height less than x is at most O of x to the 5, 6 plus epsilon. And so, so as I was talking about, the hard work is getting rid of that epsilon. And that epsilon is all because of the cusps. And the cusps are now considerably more complicated because there are these two invariants, and they're both cutting off uh, this cusp. And you sort of have to analyze the geometry of that. Uh, and so the techniques that I was talking about yesterday, about averaging over the group, those are what allow uh, when to handle this cusp, one finds the, so in each of the cusps that occur, you find the subvariety that contains only reducible forms in there. And when you count only the irreducibles, then it turns out the epsilon disappears in that averaging method that I talked about yesterday. So, so the theorem is, 
So applying the, uh, those techniques that I talked about uh, yesterday, uh, you get rid of the epsilon, and you in fact get an exact asymptotic. So the total number of binary cortex that have positive discriminant and height less than x uh, is this 12 over 135 times zeta 2 times x to the 5, 6. And uh, for a negative discriminant, height less than x, it's this 32 over 135 zeta 2 times x to the 5, 6. Uh, and if you add them, you get the 44 over 135, <laughs> which uh, I mentioned yesterday. So how is the discriminant expressed in i and j? Uh, it's four I, minus 4 i cubed minus 27 j squared. Oh, well, something those like this. Oh, sorry. It's 4 i cubed minus j squared. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> or mi minus 4 i cubed minus j squared. So yeah, so Oh, oops. <laughs> one of them is asymptotic, and one of them is exactly equal. <laughs> okay, yeah, so the, uh, one gets lower order terms. Um, uh, easily one gets O of x to the 3 quarters as a second, as a second term. Um, okay, so, okay so, the, so, so what this is saying is that, so these are the asymptotics for the total number of binary cortex. But now the question, uh, analogous to what I said for the cubics, is how many are you, are you getting on average? So if you fix an i and j, uh, how many classes are you getting uh, on average with that i and j as i and j vary? So to answer that question, you need to know, well, how many i's and j's are we summing over here? And so the question is, well, what i's and j's can actually occur as invariants for binary quartic forms? Uh, so that's... So if we understood how many i's and j's are actually occurring, then we could divide by that and we'd get a, an average number for... Uh, how many occur per ij okay, for those ij that actually occur. So we call such an ij eligible. So a pair ij is eligible uh, if it occurs as the invariance of some integer binary quartic form. Okay. And we want to know what are the eligible ij, okay, what are the possible ij's that occur. And it turns out that the set of eligible ij is defined purely by congruence conditions. Okay. This is something that I found a little surprising uh, first. But uh, when you work it out, the congruence conditions uh, are just those four. So if, if a binary quartic form, I mean, if i and j satisfy uh, one of these uh, four uh, congruence conditions, then it turns out there will be a binary quartic form that has those invariants i, comma, j. So the set of i, comma, j that occurs is just a union of translates of lattices inside z cross z. So that's very convenient. So you can, it's very easy then to count the total number of i, j having height less than x because they're just given by congruence conditions. It's kind of like in the, in the quadratic case, binary quadratic case, the only i's and j's that occur, I mean, the only discriminants that occur are 0, 1, mod 4. This is kind of the analog for i and j. And the same happens for the cubic case. The only discriminants that occur are exactly the ones that are 0, 1, mod 4, and the, they all occur. Uh, um, and somehow the, the denominators that appear all have 4s and 27s, and so they're... Right, the discriminant involves a 4 and a 27 <laughs> when you're... Right. Yeah, I think that's why. What surprises is that there's no third occurring. Yeah, right, that's what's more surprising, yeah. <laughs> so you sort of expected 2 and 3 to occur, but the fact that 2 doesn't occur is kind of surprising. Uh, okay, so, so it's just given uh, just in terms of these finitely many congruence conditions. And so what that means is that the total number of ij having height less than x is, that, is then a constant times x to the 5, 6, right? Because i i cubed is bounded by x and j squared is bounded by x. So 1 is bounded by x to the third and 1 is bounded by x squared. And so the total number of ij's is about x to the 5, 6 times an explicit constant that you can compute. There it is. So the total number of i's and j's having height less than x uh, is 8 over 27 times x to the 5, 6. So the 27 comes because these are mod 27 congruence conditions and then 8 is there because you count the total number of uh, such translates you have to take. Okay, so the total number of ij's is 8 over 27 times x to the 5, 6 that have height less than x. And so you can get the average number of binary cortex per ij by just dividing the sums we had before by the total numbers of ij's that we have. And so the theorem that you get is that the average number of positive discriminant binary cortex forms per eligible ij is 3 zeta 2 over 2. And the average number of negative discriminant binary cortex forms per eligible ij uh, is zeta 2. And so I just want to point out the analogous theorems can be proven for equivalence class of binary cortex satisfying any desired set of congruence conditions. Uh, and you can get analogous uh, constants, the constants change by certain Euler factors depending on the primes that occur in the congruence conditions. Okay, so the, the main point here is that the average number of binary cor uh, cortic forms that occur 
for given values of the invariants is a finite, is a bounded constant, is a finite constant, and it's in fact those constants. It doesn't grow with the size of i and j, like it did for binary quadratics. It's more like the binary cubic case. Uh, the average number of classes you have per values of the invariants is a finite constant. Okay, so, okay, so, so now that those results for binary quadratics are there in place, how does this relate to, to average ranks of elliptic curves? So, so remember, we're approaching ranks of elliptic curves by their two Selmer groups. And we have this exact sequence that relates the two Selmer group and E mod 2E and Sha. Uh, so the way we explicitly think of the two Selmer group uh, as, as the group of locally soluble two coverings of E. So what is a two covering of E, first of all? Uh, and then I'll explain what locally soluble is. So a two covering of E is a genus one curve C that fits into a commutative diagram like this. So, so you, have one, you have one isomorphism of C with E over the complex numbers, but then you have a map from C to E uh, defined over the rationals, uh, which commutes with multiplication by two. So the way to think of a two-covering C is sort of a model over Q of the multiplication by two map. Okay. So it's kind of multiplication by two on E, but it's a, it's a form over Q. Okay. So, so it looks like multiplication... Uh, by two over the complex numbers, but it's a form over the rational numbers. So that's what a two, that's what a two covering is. And the two covering is called soluble if it has a rational point on it. Okay. So it may just be a genus one curve uh, form of E over Q that doesn't have a rational point. So it may just be a homogeneous space for E, but if, it's sol if it has a rational point, it's called soluble. And it's called locally soluble if it has uh, a local point uh, for every place. So that's the, that's the way we explicitly think of the two Selmer group, is as locally soluble two coverings. So soluble two coverings, it's easy to see, those correspond to EQ mod 2EQ. And the locally soluble ones are sort of the things that look like, uh, well, they're the locally soluble two coverings. That's the two Selmer group. And so this is the mm, classical way that uh, people did two descent, uh, as developed by Castles and uh, Bert Swinnerton Dyer and their computations. Uh, when they did their original computations, this is how they computed uh, two Selmer groups, was, uh, was as modeling them as locally soluble two coverings. And the key lemma that they used as well, and that we're going to use here, is that uh, is due to Castles, which says that if, if C is a locally soluble two covering of E, in other words, if it's an element of the two Selmer group, then that curve C, a genus one curve C, has a positive rational divisor of degree two. In other words, it has a degree two map to P1 uh, defined over Q. And, and the proof is very nice. So the reason is that, well, okay, if C is, a, is, a, is a, this locally soluble two covering, in particular, it's a, uh, it's a homogeneous space of order two. Uh, it's an order two in the Vey Chatelet group. And so we have this natural map from C cross C to E, uh, just given by addition, right? Because it was a form of, multi of the multiplication by two map. And so you have this map from C cross C to E, defined over Q. And if you take the inverse image uh, of O, of the identity, uh, then this gives you, uh, well, this, this gives you your involution uh, on C. And modding out by this involution will give you a, a curve of genus zero over Q. And the point is that uh, since C has a local point uh, at every place, then its image will give you a local point at every place for this genus zero curve. And so, it has, so this genus zero curve has a local point for every place, and so it has to be P1. And so... Uh, so if you're a locally soluble two covering, then you actually have a positive rational divisor of degree two, okay, by a local global principle for genus zero curves. Okay. Uh, so what, that, what does that mean? That means that you ha if C is a locally soluble two covering, if it's an element of the two Selmer group, then it always has a degree two covering of P1 over Q. And since it's genus one, it must ramify four points then. Uh, and when you have four points, then you have a binary quartic form, if you have four points in P1. So, okay, so that was... Uh, this is, I thought I'd include this because it's really pretty. It's very easy. Uh, so if C is a locally soluble two covering of E, then, then it's equipped with, it, it comes with a double cover of P1, ramified at four points. And so this gives you a binary quartic form over Q. And it's easy to see that this binary quartic form will be well-defined up to GL2Q equivalence, so up to rational equivalence. And this correspondence is exactly what Bertson, Swinnert, and Dyer used for the original computations, and that's what uh, um, John Cremona uses in, in the MW rank program 
is this two descent using binary quartics. So, so to prove the main theorem about the, two, uh, the average size of the two cellular group being three, uh, here's what we do. So given A, B, and Z, uh, so A, B being the A, B for an elliptic curve, E, A, B. Uh, so A and B are minimal in that sense at all primes. And so you have an E, A, B. So given such an A, B, you choose an integral binary quartic form for each element of the two cellular group uh, of E, A, B. Okay, so we know that there's a rational one corresponding to each one. We choose an integral model for each such rational equivalence class of binary quartic form that corresponds to that two cellular element. To each two cellular element of EAB, you find a rational integral quartic form, and then you take an integral model. Okay? And we want that integral model, that integral representative inside the GL2Q equivalence class of rational and binary quartic forms, we want it to satisfy a couple of properties. First of all, that y squared equals that binary quartic. Okay, the double cover that ramifies at the four points uh, that are the roots of that binary quartic, that should give the desired two covering over Q. We want it to do that. And, and the second thing, and this is the main thing, is that the invariance uh, I and J of the binary quartic agree with the invariance A and B of the elliptic curve. So you get the, you find an integral model such that the invariance of the elliptic curve and the invariance uh, of the binary quartic match up. Mm, exactly. Uh, at least away from two and three. You can't actually get it at two and three, but luckily that's only two primes. Okay, so you deal with it. <laughs> uh, okay, and so, so what we've done is that to each two cellular element of, uh, of elliptic curves EAB, we've produced an integral binary quartic form that corresponds to it. And now we just want to count those integral binary quartic forms of bounded height, because bounded height will correspond to bounded height on the elliptic curve, because we've made the invariance match up. Wait, you said binary quartic. Binary. Two variables? Two variables. So yeah. it's specializing one of the variables to one, and you say that for that? Oh, yeah, 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 right, right. Yeah, that's kind of, or think of it in weighted, weighted projective space. OK, so now we just want to count these integral binary quartic forms. Now, the problem is that the binary quartic forms that we produce this way are not even close to being all binary quartic forms. So the methods I described yesterday count all binary quartic forms up to bounded height, right? And co they're co-regular space for counting all orbits. But here, we just want to count uh, a rather thin set of orbits. Uh, these orbits turn out to be def defined by congruence conditions at every local place. Uh, but at every, at really every local place. So it's defined by infinitely many congruence conditions. And one has to count these. Uh, and I mentioned a theorem where you could count it by finitely many congruence conditions, but in order to do infinitely many congruence conditions, you have to, uh, you have to use some, uh, some sort of sieve methods. And so you sieve down to those integral binary quartic forms that you've uh, set aside in, in the first part there that correspond to the two cellular elements. It locally soluble everywhere, but it's more than that because um, each rational orbit could have many integral orbits corresponding to it. And that's an issue that one has to deal with. And sometimes uh, one rational orbit has lots of integral orbits corresponding to it. And we only want to count one of them. And so that makes the set even thinner than, uh, than before. Uh, so it's local solubility plus the fact that you're, you're trying to choose one integral orbit for every rational orbit. But, and the other thing that's not obvious, I mean, that, this is the algebraic side that has to be proved, is that, uh, that there is an integral orbit that <laughs> where the, orbit, the invariance would match up. Because okay? it could be that when you take an integral orbit, the, the invariance would blow up. But luckily. Uh, this is something it's you can prove. To the maximal orders out of all of yeah, it is, it is similar, uh, but harder. <laughs> but yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, Melanie talked a little bit about these uniformity estimates. One has to prove the, the necessary uniformity estimates. So when you're imposing more and more conditions on the primes, you have to know that the error is not building up too much. And that requires certain uniformity estimates. Uh, and that's by far the most technical part of this work. And that's why I won't talk about it. Uh, but it involves uh, doing another count. Uh, so the uniformity estimates can be proven by embedding binary quartic forms into some of the bigger, uh, some of the bigger co-regular spaces that I talked about, and then counting points in there, and then moving, the, uh, moving it, uh, that uniformity estimate back to binary quartic forms. So actually, a lot of the co-regular spaces end up playing a role, even though binary quartics uh, are sort of the main one where you've embedded the, the problem that you're interested in. Uh, so yeah, in particular, you end up counting. Uh, points of bounded invariance in a certain non-reductive co-regular space of dimension 12. Uh, OK. So anyway, so once, once this count is performed, though, the sieve can be performed. And once, once that's done, and the uniformity estimate is proven, and use that to carry out the sieve, and you finally obtain that when all elliptic curves, e over q, uh, in any family defined by finitely many congruence conditions, are ordered by height, the average size of the two Selmer group is 3. And so in particular, uh, the average rank of all elliptic curves when ordered by height is at most 1.5. Okay, so that's how, uh, that's how the proof of that goes. 
right. Any questions on that? Before I Right, exactly. Right, right. It's actually a pretty thin set, but luckily a dense enough thin set that you, know, you, can, sieve, you can do a sieve that, that gets down to it. So, so in a lot of these cases, the, the objects that are being counted uh, just by, in the bijection don't seem terribly interesting. They don't even necessarily even mean anything well-defined sometimes. But you can find, if you, as for certain problems, you can find an embedding <laughs> into the orbit space somehow and calculate what is the image and hope that it's sort of not too thin that you can sieve, sieve to it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there isn't, a, there isn't a whole good theory of forms over Z of these, uh, of, of these two summer elements. I mean, I mean there, there may be something interesting there, but one has to develop a sort of theory over Z, and then, uh, and then if, yeah, the, you could get the asymptotics of that <laughs> once you develop that theory. <laughs> so, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, right. And it doesn't change the averages, actually. So actually, you can, uh, I mean, the, the height I took, uh, I took is the one that people classically take as the naive height. But you could change, you could count them with multiplicities and, uh, and allow all a, b, for example, instead of just the minimal ones. Or you could, you could change uh, the 4 and 27 to whatever you want. Or, and even you can change the exponents a little bit, too. Like in the same sense that Melanie was talking about yesterday, you could just tweak the exponents of i and j a little bit and get uh, so different averages of elliptic curves. And any time you can prove it that, that uh, the average over that funny, uh, a different ordering, it always comes out to be three. <laughs> so regardless of the ordering, whenever you can prove it. Okay, uh, okay so what about three Selmer? So, so it turns out one can also determine the average size of the three Selmer group of elliptic curves. Uh, and here, instead of using binary quartic forms, one uses ternary cubic forms. So uh, three Selmer elements of elliptic curves are parametrized by three coverings, and those can be parametrized in, a, in an analogous way by ternary cubic forms. So again, not all ternary cubic forms, but those that are locally soluble, and then you pick one integral model for each one, and you show that it, uh, you can make the invariance match up. Uh, and so you proceed in an analogous way, but now the dimension is much bigger, and the cusp are considerably more complicated. But this, uh, uh, this can eventually be done. And when, so what you find is that when all elliptic curves, E over Q, uh, in any family defined by finitely many congruence conditions are ordered by height, the mean size of the three Selmer group uh, is four. Okay, so again, 4 never actually occurs as the size of the 3-Selmer group. It's just the average. Uh, so it's, a, it's the average of a bunch of powers of 3, because right? the 3-Selmer group is a power of 3. And so the worst case scenario here for the rank is that uh, for every uh, 5 3s, you get a, a 9, something like that. Uh, is that right? Yeah. Every 5 3s, you get a 9. That's kind of the worst case scenario. And so uh, that means for, every, for values of the rank, for every 5 1s, you get a 2. And so this shows that the average rank of elliptic curves when ordered by height is, is less than one and a sixth. Right. So, so as, you, as you get results for higher Selmer, you get better bounds on the rank. And that's something that, so the average, uh, average rank is bounded by one and a sixth uh, through this three Selmer method. So I want to mention some consequences uh, of knowing that, because there are some consequences that you couldn't get from two Selmer, but you can now get from three Selmer. So, so, so consider the following family of elliptic curves that are defined basically by congruence conditions. Okay, so just some congruence conditions define these funny conditions on the elliptic curve. The only point I want to make is that if you sort of impose these, uh, these conditions on the set of elliptic curves you're considering, uh, it is a positive proportion set of all elliptic curves. Okay. So the conditions are that E and its twists both have additive reduction at 2. J invariant is a, uh, is a two-attic unit over the two attics. Uh, it has ordinary, good ordinary reduction at 3. And the odd part of the discriminant is square free and congruent to 1 mod 4. Okay, so these so are just some set of congruence conditions. Uh, infinitely many, but it's still one can show uh, by a sieve method that these are a positive proportion of all elliptic curves. And moreover, the results about 3 Selmer also apply to this family, again, by a, by a sieve. You sieve down to just this set of elliptic curves. So in other words, the average size of 3 Selmer, even over this family, uh, is 4. Okay. And the reason we chose these congruence conditions is that uh, they're chosen with the property that if E is twisted by, uh, by the pr prime minus 1, <laughs> by minus 1, 
then, okay, so if E is twisted by minus 1, then the analytic root number of E uh, and of E twisted by minus 1 are different. So, for, so all the elliptic curves in this family have this property that when you twist by minus 1, the root number flips. Okay. So that's, that's how this family was chosen. So they're chosen so that when you twist by minus 1, the root number flips. And so what that means is that in this family, exactly half the root numbers are plus 1 and exactly half are minus 1 in this positive proportion family. So if you assume BSD, that means that half of the, the curves in this family have odd rank and half have even rank. Uh, but we don't know BSD. Uh, but there is this amazing result, recent result, uh, which came just in time, by, uh, uh, by the Dachschitzer brothers, uh, Tim and Vladimir, that states that the parity of the P-Selmer rank of E uh, does actually always agree uh, with the root number. So the, the parity of the P-Selmer rank of E is even exactly when the root number is, is 1, and it's odd exactly when the root number is minus 1. And so you can see how that's useful, because now it tells us, when we were talking about these powers of 3 that are averaging the 4, in this family, we know that the odd powers of 3 and the even powers of 3 have to occur equally often in this family. So if you combine this with the fact that the 3 Selmer average is the most 4 in this family, and the fact that the 3 Selmer groups uh, have order powers of 3, uh, this allows one to prove that when all elliptic curves, uh, E over Q, are ordered by height, a positive proportion of them have rank 0. Right, the reason is because, well, before we were saying the worst case scenario is that you have a bunch of threes and then a nine. But you can't have a bunch of threes and then a nine because the parity, there, you have too many odd ranks and too few even ranks of, of three Selmer parity. So some, you have to have some ones in there that come as, as, as three Selmer group sizes. And so those, those curves have to have rank zero. Okay, so when all elliptic curves are ordered by height, a positive portion of them have to have rank zero. Okay, so that's the, that's the reason it's not possible for all the curves to have rank greater than zero and preserve this parity condition in this family, which is a positive proportion family. So at least, in fact, half, at least half of these uh, curves in this family have to have rank zero. Um, so a similar argument gives... Uh, uh, if, you assume, if you assume Sha is finite, right, then, then you know that if the three Selma group is of size three, then the curve has to have rank one. So, assuming the Sha is always finite, then you get that all elliptic curves when ordered by height, then a positive proportion of them will have rank 1. Okay. But this one is conditional, right? It's a conditional on Sha being finite. Um, okay, what about analytic rank? Uh, so, if we look at the L function of the elliptic curve, uh, can we show non vanishing of, of those things? And so, there's the recent result of, of Skinner and Ben, also just in time for this, <laughs> is that if the L function uh, of an elliptic curve vanishes at s equals 1. And, and if E has good ordinary reduction at 3, uh, then that means that the 3 Selman group of E has to be non-trivial. That follows from uh, uh, this recent work of Skinner and Urban. So, right, so they're saying if the elliptic curve vanishes, then the 3 Selman group has to be non-trivial. It has to be bigger. So in particular, if the 3 Selman group is trivial, then that implies uh, assuming th this, these, uh, these conditions of good and ordinary reduction at 3, it implies that the L function doesn't vanish. And so in this family, which is a positive proportion family, since you know that the 3 Selmer group is uh, at most 4 in size on average, uh, this allows us to prove that when all elliptic curves E over Q are ordered by height, uh, a positive proportion of them have analytic rank 0. In other words, have non-vanishing uh, L functions. So, so this proves a positive proportion of elliptic curve L functions uh, are non-vanishing at, uh, at this critical point. And so what that means is that this is a positive proportion family of elliptic curves that have both analytic and algebraic rank 0. So, so that implies that a positive proportion of elliptic curves uh, satisfy the Birch and Smirch and Dyer conjecture. No, it's, a, it's for general P. Yeah, yeah. And it even works for 2 now, I think. Uh, but we couldn't apply that result for 2. <laughs> because uh, right, when the average size of the 2 Selmer group was 3, uh, you could uh, have half 2s and half 4s. And that doesn't contradict, right? They have the same amount of odds and evens. And so you don't get a contradiction there. Uh, it just exactly works out for two. And I was afraid that would always happen at every prime, <laughs> that there would be some conspiracy that just makes it fail. But uh, for three, it seems to be good. So, OK, so, yeah, so that gives you non-vanishing. It gives you a positive portion of BSD, just, uh, just by these parity kinds of arguments. Uh, OK, so what about four Selmer and five Selmer? It seems like each time you go up Selmer, it seems to help. 
So uh, as you saw yesterday, there were these spaces that, that gave degree 4 line bundles and degree 5 line bundles on genus 1 curves. And so one can use them to model 4 coverings and 5 coverings uh, in a similar way by proving the analogous results, uh, uh, like that Castle's result I showed you. Um, and that leads to analogous results for 4-selmer and 5-selmer. Uh, these spaces are a lot bigger, though. One is 20-dimensional and one is 50-dimensional. And it took many months to, to do this. Uh, but we just finished just about a month and a half ago. And so here are the results for 4-selmer and 5-selmer, is that when all elliptic curves, E over Q, in any family defined by congruence conditions, are ordered by height, uh, the mean size of the 4-selmer group is 7. And the mean size of the 5 cylinder group is 6. Anyone see the pattern? Yeah, OK. <laughs> it's easier than the pattern I talked about in the number field case. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, so there's a, so right, so it's the sum of the divisor's function. Uh, is what comes out. And there's a heuristic that, and, and just like the number field heuristics I talked about, there's a heuristic that comes out of these arguments uh, that, that, that says that the average size of n-selmer uh, should be the sum of the divisors of n. And there's another interpretation of, of, of these numbers coming out, which is that if you look at the non-identity elements, sorry, if you look at the, okay, so for n-selmer, if you look at the order n elements in n-selmer, uh, that on average should be the Tamagawa number of the group that's acting on the, on the representation that you're using uh, to, to do that count. Uh, so for example, for, uh, uh, for binary cortex, uh, the, tam the, the group that's actually acting is PGL2. Uh, uh, and uh, when we do this count for, for, uh, for Selmer elements, and PGL2 has Tamagawa number 2. And so that's why you expect uh, two elements on average having order 2 in the 2 Selmer group. <laughs> Right? And in the same way, uh, so in general, the group uh, that you use uh, in counting n selmer is PGLN, and that's why you expect, n, so on average, you expect n uh, elements uh, in n selmer having order n. <laughs> okay, that's what that says. Okay, so that's another heuristic that comes out of this. So a number of heuristics come out of this. But of course, uh, tomorrow Bjorn will, uh, will talk about uh, another set of heuristics that gives exactly these numbers. Uh, so that kind of explains uh, what these numbers mean uh, and why we expect these numbers to occur. Uh, Okay, so, so as I said, as, as you prove results for higher and higher Selmer, it seems to give better results on the rank. And uh, so using the last, the last theorem, uh, okay, so the average size is 6 of the 5 Selmer group. Uh, and of course, the 5 Selmer group are all, their orders are all powers of 5. So the worst case scenario is that you get 1 5 for every 9, wait, sorry, <laughs> you get 19 fives for every 1 25. Right? That's sort of the worst case scenario. And so that proves that the average rank is at most 1.05. That's what that last one uh, says just immediately. But if we combine that argument uh, with these changing of root numbers things, so taking unions of families where you can twist by things to change root numbers and then try to, try to take as much advantage of parity as you can, uh, we, were one, we really wanted to get the average rank less than 1 because <laughs> that would... Uh, that would uh, 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 well, that has some other consequences. In particular, you immediately see that the positive portion of curves have rank less than, uh, uh, have rank zero. So, so combining this 1.05 argument with the 19 fives and the, the 125 with these twisting, you know, with these twisting things, we uh, were finally able to do this uh, just uh, about three, four weeks ago. So when all elliptic curves E over Q are ordered by height, the average rank is less than one. Uh, that number that comes out is 0.99. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think uh, I think if we work re if we work really hard, it would uh, it, around 0.7, 0.8. It seems like it's possible within reach. And maybe I should say that if we knew these n Selmer averages for all n, and we knew that the root number is equidistributed, then that would imply the rank distribution conjecture. So that so this is sort of if what, if this were to continue, then it would actually prove the rank distribution conjecture. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. So eventually, yeah, it, it, I think it already almost shows that the, the data will turn around. So I, I, I didn't believe it when I first saw the graph, but I, I, uh, <laughs> I've come around to Starnex. <laughs> yeah, 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 it will. Uh, there's some of the other, oh, sorry? Right, right. Uh, so there's some, uh, some of William Stein's graphs where he was looking at just square-free conductor 
uh, classes where the average rank actually got past this 0.87 and it's, it's reached one. Uh, and, in that, and we can do the sieve methods on that, on that family too and get an average rank less than one. And so for that particular graph, it, it's already shown that it, the graph will turn around. The yeah. graph was ordered by Kuhn Vector. It was ordered by, no, he has, he, uh, it looks, it approaches uh, similar things. Uh, yeah, yeah, for these non-reductive, there are analogs of these non-reductive things that you had to embed it in to get the uniformity estimates yeah, in each of these cases. So actually all these, uh, I only mentioned these two spaces, but there are a number of non-regular spaces that one, one uses to count these auxiliary points and the cusp and they get uniformity estimates. Um, okay, so, so I guess that's the theorem I want to end with. Just some final remarks. So of course some similar counting techniques can be applied to various other co-regular spaces uh, and it'll eventually lead to densities of uh, various other uh, data associated to elliptic curves. Uh, so, as I mentioned, there are about 50 other spaces that parameterize genus 1 curves. And uh, with extra data of various kinds, so that's the joint work with Wei that I talked about yesterday. And so, for example, uh, what we uh, should eventually have there is uh, average, rank, average sizes of 2 selmer or 3 selmer in various families of elliptic curves. So the families include things like uh, family, all family of all elliptic curves with one marked point. So in other words, family of all elliptic curves that have rank at least 1, family of all elliptic curves that have rank at least 2. Uh, when we'll get um, average size of two selmer and three selmer so the uh, there. Uh, well, zero percent of them will be torsion because you don't expect. Yeah. So if you take the family of all elliptic curves with two marked points, 100 percent of them will have rank two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I think I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Thank